not hiring. Okay, so we're going to talk about gunshot wounds today, which I'm sure you guys are all very excited about. So here's what we're going to go through today. We're going to go through statistics about them, look at bullet construction and how bullets work, and then we're going to look at how bullets go through ballistic gel to show the damage it causes. Talk a little bit about guns that fire the bullets, and then we'll go a little bit through how bullets go through your tissues and what they destroy and how they work. And then probably the important thing for you guys is about documentation. It's really important what you document. There's nothing more exhilarating to be shot at with no result. Winston Churchill said that. I'm not sure if that's true. I definitely don't want to be shot at. <laughs> Whatever. So 230 million to 300 million guns in the country. There are only 320 million people in the country. So that's almost one gun per person. That's a crazy, crazy stat. Out of those, 60 million are handguns, and those are the ones that we worry about because you can't really walk around with a rifle or a shotgun in the city. Most of the people have guns sit on their possession. 13,000 deaths per year. That's almost 36 deaths a day caused by guns. And those numbers don't even include suicides, okay? Um, 750 of them, or 56 of them, are children. Most of them don't carry guns. So what is a bullet made of? Well, when you guys say bullet, that's actually the, not the correct term. It's called a cartridge. The bullet is only the top part, the projectile at the top, all right? The bullet is the, the piece that gets shot out, while the cartridge is the whole entire thing. So the cartridge is made up of a case, which is usually brass or copper, and then the gunpowder behind it, which is usually smokeless powder, so it doesn't make a big mess, and then the bullet on top and a primer in the bottom. So what happens is they put a bullet in the case and they crimp it, so it's really, really tight in there and won't come out. And that's just a, str a tremendous force behind it. The firing pin of the gun hits the primer, which makes a spark. It goes through the flash hole and ignites the powder, the smokeless powder. That powder burns very, very rapidly and forms a tremendous amount of gas, which builds up in the cartridge, and that expels the bullet out the front once it reaches some critical amount of pressure that releases that crimping. <coughs> this is what it looks like. So let's talk about bullets. Bullets come in with all really different shapes and sizes and weights, and they're meant to do different things. Each bullet is actually really, really specific in how it's constructed and how it's gonna change. So on the left, those four on the left are pistol bullets. They're a little bit smaller, a little bit less mass. And on the right, these are all adult bullets. Uh, I'm sorry, rifle bullets. Notice that, <laughs> right? These bullets. They're big bullets. Notice that big 600 nitro, that's an elephant gun. That's a seriously big bullet. And this last one on the end is a 50 caliber machine gun. This is used for wartime. This is really meant to cause a lot of damage. So bullets are measured in hundredths of an inch. That's what caliber is. So a 30 caliber bullet is 30 hundredths of an inch wide. All right, that's what they're measured as. But you can also do it in millimeters. A seven millimeter is seven millimeters wide, as you'd expect. So just remember that a 30 caliber or 30 hundredths of an inch is equal to 7.62 millimeters. That's the conversion between them. So a nine millimeter is a little bigger than a 30 caliber. That's a bullet, uh, gun that police commonly carry. Notice here the 45 is the biggest of the pistol rounds. That's the gun that my ex-wife used to carry. Uh, my ex-girlfriend used to carry. I still worry about that. <laughs> so let's look at energy. And this is actually important because when a bullet injures you, it depends how much energy it has to injure you. All right, so this nice 25 with a 38, they're small weight. They only have 35 grains and 110 grains. And they only have a little bit of energy, 62 joules and 200 joules. Get down to your 44 Magnum. These are a lot heavier, 180 grains, and a lot bigger uh, muzzle velocity. All right, so these have 1,000 joules. Look at that big 600 nitro, 900 grains, huge, huge, huge bullet, plus a lot of speed, a lot of damage, and obviously your 50 caliber machine gun, tremendous amount of energy behind that to cause damage to your body. So just a couple conversion factors, 0.068 grains equals one gram, all right? So if you look at that 44 Magnum bullet, that's 180 grains, that's a 12 gram bullet, or 0.43 ounces, a little under half an ounce. That's a pretty big bullet. Another conversion, 1,000 feet per second is 682 miles per hour, all right? So if you're in a 65 mile an hour car, that's 93 feet per second. So let's look at bullet design. And if you shoot 10 bullets from the same gun into ballistic gel, all 10 bullets will come out looking pretty much the same. And they do this on purpose because they want the effect out of the bullet. So you have these mushroom bullets, right? When a bullet shot out of a gun, you want it to be aerodynamic. You want it to be nice and narrow and fly through the air straight, and you want it to hit whatever you're trying to hit with it. But when it gets to the body, the cavity it makes depends on the width of the bullet. So you want the bullet to suddenly get wide when it gets to the body. So that's what these mushroom bullets do. They're copper in the back and lead on top, and what happens is when the bullet hits your body, 
it mushrooms out. It gets a big, wide front, and now the cavity it makes in your tissue is much, much bigger. So they make it like this on purpose with a solid, solid back and a mushy, soft front. Lead is a very soft metal. If you could get it to be even wider, you could cause more damage, right? So they have these expanding bullets, which cause a tremendous amount of damage when they go through you. And then, of course, you have these that are wide and sharp. These are called talons for good reason. What they do is they have thin sections of copper and then thick sections, and then it's thick right around here, as you can see here, so it stays bent out. So when the bullet goes through you, or when the bullet hits you, it opens up into this like flower shape with these really sharp, pointy edges. And then everything that goes past, it destroys as it goes next to it, right? So it just rips through your tissue. The other thing you can do is you can make it fragment. So ideally, you want a bullet that has a nice, fat, big center that fragments to little pieces, because little pieces have a more chance of hitting things that are around it. When a bullet goes through you in a straight line, it'll only hit what's on that line. But if you can make it spread out with pieces, you're going to hit more things. And ideally, what you want to do is you want a bullet to hit something important, like a vessel or an organ that you need, and then when it goes through there, it destroys it. So if you have more pieces going in different directions, you have more chance of hitting something important. So if you look at muzzle velocities and how it changes, this is all the same bullet, but fired with different muzzle velocities. And the way you change muzzle velocity is make the muzzle of the gun longer or put more gunpowder behind it. So if the bullet is being pushed by that gas, if it has a longer muzzle, then you'll have a much higher speed because you have more of a chance for the, for the gas to push the bullet faster. So you'll notice when you hit 1,500 feet per second, pretty much stays intact. And it's not until you get to around 2,000 that it starts to fragment. All right, so once you get to 2,000 feet per second, these bullets break up. Once you get up to 3,000 feet per second, then that bullet is really falling apart. So you have many little pieces going in all different directions, much more chance to hit things. So the way the bullet acts inside your body is dependent on the speed that it hits you from outside your body. So we have something called weight retention. This is an important concept. The more the bullet has weight and stays together, the deeper it penetrates. But it only makes a little hole at the surface and you don't bleed that much out of it, you don't lose your blood. So ideally what you want to do is you want to have separation of the jacket from the bullet. This way the bullet will penetrate nice and deep and make a big hole, but the jacket will fragment and form a big gaping wound at the edge and all your blood will fall out and everything will fall out. It won't tamponade and you won't stay alive. You'll fall, you'll die. All right, that's fragmenting design. So this is the ideal bullet. It has a nice big back weight that stays together, but a bunch of little fragments that go in all different directions. That's how it kills you. So a couple facts about them. Rifles have a higher muzzle velocity than handguns do because they have a longer barrel. That kind of makes sense. Hunting rifles are faster than assault rifles, but it's a matter of being dead or really dead. It sort of doesn't matter. The thing about assault rifles is they can shoot very, very rapidly, and they can shoot more bullets. So that's how come they're so much more deadly. Elephants are not safe. Remember that 600 nitro? That is a huge, huge bullet. And much depends on the design of bullet. The bullet, how it's constructed, is really what changes how it, how it does damage to your body. So let's talk about how bullets actually injure your body now. So bullets don't drill nice and neatly through your body. They rip and they tear tissue, right? And as they go through you, they form this cavity inside you, the primary cavity. It's dependent on how much energy the bullet has. You guys remember that kinetic energy is mv squared over two. Mass times velocity squared over two. So velocity is important, it's squared. It's an important fact, so the faster you make the bullet go, the more energy it has. So when the bullet hits you, it starts to slow down. It has a certain amount of energy when it gets to your skin. That's mv squared over 2. If you can stop a bullet inside you, then 100% of the energy is donated to your body. If the bullet goes out your back, then some of the energy is lost, and that's not effective. Bullet makers want to give you all that energy. They want to do the most possible damage to your skin if they can. All right. So remember that energy is measured in joules or foot pounds. So what happens? The bullet hits you and it donates energy to your body. It rips through the tissues and causes that primary cavity. But the bullet, in order for it to hit you correctly and in the right place, it has to get to you. So what the rifle makers do is they put this thing in there called rifling. This is like grooves that are spiral down the barrel of the gun. And what that does is it starts the bullet turning. And you guys know that once something's turning, it flies straight. When the bullet hits you, it, on impact, it changes conformation. You guys saw that nice mushroom shape that it flattens out and makes a bigger hole. Objects can also deflect the bullet, causing it to yaw or fragment. All right? That's what happens at your skin. It changes, changes shape, changes mobility. So again, if you can stop the bullet inside your body, that study is called terminal ballistics. And that's what companies spend hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars on to make their bullets better bullets, the better at killing. 
So when the bullet hits you, it shreds the tissue and makes a hole right through the tissue. That's the primary cavity. That's dependent on how wide the bullet is. But there's also a secondary cavity where it flings the tissue out to the side and destructs it too by sort of like waves, right? The temporary cavity is called cavitation and it only lasts five to 10 milliseconds, right? That's five one thousandths of a second. But there's actually pulsations. You can see it go out, come back, go out and come back. So the type of issue, uh, type of damage depends on the tissue that it's hitting. Something that's solid and rigid, when that secondary blast cavity hits it, it's really gonna destroy it. While something that's like soft and elastic, it'll go out and come back. So stuff like lung and muscle, that's soft, it's pliable, it's mushy. So it goes out and comes back and you don't cause that much damage. But something that like brain or bone, when the blast cavity hits it, it just destroys it and it doesn't come back to, to form and back to its normal configuration. So here's a bullet through bullet gel, all right? This is ballistics gel. And you can see here, there's a nice primary cavity going down the middle. But how it got there is very, very different. All right, let's see if this video works. Hopefully it does. So here's a bullet hitting the gel. It forms that primary cavity. But look at that secondary blast cavity oh. as it's going out. It expands wider than the gel, all right? And then you'll see it come back together. And when it all comes back and smacks into itself, there's actually an explosion there from all the force. Right, you can see it imploding on itself here, on high speed, and right there, there's an explosion. Right, so that's all from the tissues smacking into each other. So think about that happening inside your body. You're gonna destroy everything that's inside there. That's why it's not a straight linear trail. It's actually got a little bit wider. That's the blast cavity that's inside. Is this gel like is that similar to like human? So ballistics gel is made because it's similar to human body density. Uh, that's how so it's that made. Actually happens. Yeah, that happens inside, inside your body. Inside. The tissues get flung outwards and then come back and collide, flung outwards and collide, and they just keep it's, doing that until, until it's And the little explosion thing also yeah. happens. Wow. That's how you get injured. That's sick. So a little bit of terminology. When the bullet comes out of the gun, it's rolling, and it's around the central axis. But it can also yaw from left to right, and it can pitch up and down. So if you do something called yaw and uh, roll, that's a spiral. Right? As you go to the right, it goes to the right, and then you bring it around and around, and it goes into a spiral formation. So what happens when a bullet hits your cavity and it has too much pitch or too much roll, then it tumbles. And this is kind of ideal for gun makers because the more of the face that hits your body, the more damage and secondary cavity it's gonna cause. So when a bullet hits you straight, it's a little tiny profile. But if the bullet rolls inside you, it's a very big profile. So you'll notice as the bullet rolls over, the secondary cavity is much bigger. Notice too that down here, as the bullet's lost a lot of its velocity, there's no longer a, second a secondary blast cavity. So you need a certain speed to create a secondary blast cavity. So again, when the size of the bullet is the widest in the face, that's when you're gonna have the biggest cavity, the biggest secondary blast cavity. So here is the cavitation, a slow down on gel again. It's a very big blast cavity compared to the little tiny size of the bullet. It's all dependent on its velocity. Talk about guns a little bit. There are handguns and rifles and then shotguns. There are three different categories. Your handguns are semi-automatic. These are actually really smartly built by the gun maker, if you can believe that. When the bullet comes out, you guys all remember physics is an equal and, equal and opposite reaction. So that throws the hammer backwards and that reloads your gun. So the next bullet can be fired just by pulling the trigger and you not having to reload it. So it makes it very efficient. You can pull the trigger many times and shoot them very quickly. You have automatic pistols, which when the hammer gets fired uh, thrown backwards, there's no catch, and it just goes forward again as long as you're holding the trigger. So that's how you make it an automatic. So it just keeps firing with only one trigger pull. They also have much bigger magazines, so you can hold more bullets because they go very quickly. And then, of course, you have revolvers. These are from the Old West. They're not as efficient. They only hold six, bu six bullets, while a regular gun that's got a magazine on the bottom can hold 13, so it's double the amount of ammo you can carry. You have your hunting rifles. These actually have a mechanical bolt where you have to take this thing, pull it up, pull it backwards, push it forwards, and lock it down to shoot again. And that's very slow, but when you're shooting at a deer, it probably doesn't matter. They're not shooting back at you. As opposed to in wartime when you have the assault rifles, these are actually brilliantly constructed because the bullet comes out with gas behind it. It leaves the muzzle, but there's a little tube up here that has a gas tube going right back to the hammer. So that gas pushes the hammer backwards and reloads the gun. So you can shoot very, very rapidly with assault rifles as opposed to hunting rifles. And then of course you have your shotguns. Shotguns have a very, very large caliber of bullet, but they don't have only bullets inside. They have what we call lead shot or steel shot. So there's a little tiny balls in there and the balls all come out together. 
Here's the construction. Again, very similar. You have your primer, your powder, but then there's a wad of like paper or fabric that gets behind all these little balls and all these little shot and pushes them out together. And then you do have sometimes things called slugs. These are very, very large bullets that are meant for killing very big animals. So when the shot comes out of the shotgun, they tend to spread. This is kind of what you want. You want to make sure you hit what you're trying to hit. That's why they do, uh, most bird hunters use shotguns to hit birds because they're very hard to hit in the air with a single bullet. But if you have a big spray of bullets, it's much easier to get them. So there's something on a shotgun called a choke. The choke is the tip of the shotgun uh, uh, barrel. So this gun has a cylinder choke. It has no narrowing whatsoever. And at, four, at 25 yards, it reaches a 40 inch spread. As you go down, you have an improved cylinder choke, a modified choke, and a full choke. This is much narrower at the tip. And what that does is it focuses all that shot coming out so they stay together. So it's, at distance, you can see here that at 30 yards, it's 40 inches of spread. Here it's 35 yards, and here it's 40 yards. So with a full choke, it gets out to a full 40 yards before it makes it to 40 inches wide. While here, it only gets 25 yards, and it all spreads apart very easily. So it's all the tip construction that makes the little shot stay together. So here's shotgun patterns from different ranges. This guy was shot at very close range. All the shots stayed together in one spot. But as you get farther away, the shots spread out. And when you're really far away, they're very random in where they hit you. So with a shotgun, you want to make sure you hit them. But if you're far away, you're not going to donate all the energy to them. Remember, because the gunpowder is what causes the velocity of the thing coming out. And if only a couple of the shot hit you, all the other shot that miss you, that energy is wasted. It's not developed, it's not put into your body. So let's talk about injury patterns. Kind of interesting tattoos. A lot of weird people out there. So entries are usually smaller than um, exits, but not 100% of the time. They're usually round as well, but not 100% of the time. Exits are usually stellate and not round, but that's not always, always true. All right? So here's a nice entry wound, nice and round. The tissue is not destroyed. Here's an exit wound, stellate with the bullet ripping through the back, all right? So the only ones you can say that are definitely entries are when they have powder burns around them, right? When you shoot somebody at close range, that powder coming out with the bullet is still on fire and it actually burns the body and tattoos the body. Or you can get abrasion rings. This is actually the muzzle of the gun up against the body, it was put against it and it burns the body. So you know these are entrances. But the only way to be sure is either to have a powder burn, a muzzle burn, or you saw the person get shot which doesn't always happen. So here's some contact wounds. You can see that there is a burn around the hole, so you know the muzzle was touching the, touching the wound when it came out. These are what typical exit wounds look like. Right? This one's oval, this one's stellate. But sometimes they don't always obey the rule. Guys, remember that all rules are meant to be broken. So sometimes when a bullet hits you, it doesn't tumble, and it just goes straight through you, it hits your skin and stretches it and forms a little outpocketing or a little round hole. This is actually an exit wound that was confirmed by bystanders. Right? We knew the guy got shot in the front, and this is his back. It looks like an entrance, but it was an exit. You can also get some very large entrance wounds. Like if the muzzle of the gun is up against the skin, all that gas coming out behind the bullet goes into the skin and then it erupts and blows the skin out. So you can see there's a little bit of a burn here, but this... this Wound is very stellate and looks like an exit, but because of the burn, you know it's an entrance. And the bullets that don't hit you directly, they hit you sort of sideways, if you're being, not being shot at directly, those will cause oblique wounds as well. So let's look about bullets going through the, the tissue now. All right, stake is muscle. So as the bullet goes through there, it destroys it and rips it out. All right, but muscle is pliable, so it stretches. This is actually a 38 bullet. So here's a person who got shot in the foot, probably in and out. But notice that the primary cavity just goes through here, but all this other red hematoma is that secondary blast cavity, right? So a tremendous amount of energy is donated to the body to destroy the tissues. Here's a military wound. Um, entrance and exit are one and one, who knows which one is which, but there's a huge blast cavity. All this hematoma is all that secondary blast cavity that they got from the bullet donating the energy to the body. So bullet through brain, very, very non-pliable. It's going to cause a lot of problems. You guys will remember that your skull is a box. There's a couple things in the box. There's CSF, there's brain, brain and blood vessels. And anything else you add to the box is causing the box to get filled up and packed. So if I shoot you in the brain, not only do I destroy your brain, 
but it causes edema. And then an edema gets into the brain and that raises the pressures in the box and that actually adds to the killing effect of bullets. But notice here there's some brain oozing out because as the pressure's um, built up, the brain started to billow out and get pushed out by the edema. Again, being shot across the head is way worse than being shot down the middle. Um, you can see here that there's probably the entrances on this side, the bullet fragmented and broken up, dragged some blood and brain across it, and blew out the skull on the other side, making a very large exit wound. Little air in there. You know, density out here, same as density in here, so you know it's air. And again, if that secondary cavity gets to the edge of the box and pushes the box open, that causes the skull to break open. So here's a bullet through lung. Lung is really compliant. It's really soft and mushy, so it stretches a lot. All right, so um, you see the blast cavity all around the person's lung. This guy was shot by a 44. We recovered the slugs that were in the back of the body. Liver, a very, very solid tissue, a lot of organization, a lot of architecture. So when liver gets hit, that blast cavity blows it open, but it doesn't recoil back. It doesn't stretch. It just forms a massive cavity. It gets shattered. And you can see that all the stellate wounds, all right, it's going to cause a huge problem. Obviously, this liver's outside the body. This guy did not do very well. Heart, once there's a hole in the heart, it's really hard to fix it. Um, if you guys have ever tried to stitch heart, it's very friable tissue, it's a lot of muscle, so it's very hard to get the stitches to hold in it. You have to use something called pledges, which we can talk about afterwards if you want. But once you have a hole in the heart, it's pretty much game over. And then bone, bone really doesn't deform well. So when that blast cavity hits it, it just shatters into a million pieces. All right, you can see that the bone went straight across the foot and broke all the bones in its path. Again, being shot in the tip fib, it's just splintered. It's broken down into many pieces. The bullet is in fragments. It's all over the place because once it hits, it shatters and does more damage to everything around it. That's how you kill something, by destroying the vessels and destroying their blood supply. Here's the only one that I actually really care about, right? Most bullets we just leave inside the body. We don't care about them. But this is the only one that's actually dangerous for lead toxicity. When a bullet gets inside your joint, for some reason, the composition of your joint fluid will leach the lead out of the bullet. So you never go in looking for a bullet to pull it out unless it's inside a joint. Here you have to call ortho to come get it. It can stay there a couple days, it's not gonna cause a problem, but if it's there for a long term, it's gonna to lead to a lot, a lot of issues. So you really have to get the bullet out if it's inside a joint. That looks like a bullet to you guys? No, that's an electronic vibrating device. Really, really interesting construction though if you look at it, right? There's a spring in the back holding the single D-cell battery, which is attached to a motor on a spindle and there's a little weight. So the weight is off center on the spindle, so it's not in the center. When the motor spins, the weight spins, but it's not in the middle, so it vibrates. Brilliant construction. <laughs> so watch what you write when you're documenting your charts, all right? Document only what you see. You should never write, I have two gunshot wounds to the chest, or two entry wounds, or sorry, you should write, I have two gunshot wounds to the chest, one to the back. Never write entries and exits. So you shouldn't write two entries on the chest and exit on the back, because if the guy was standing in the other direction when he got shot, then you may turn the case and maybe somebody may be imprisoned for wrong reasons or somebody may be let go if they really didn't do it. So never speculate unless you know what happens. Unless you see those powder burns or a muzzle mark, never write entrances, right? You, don't, you actually don't know. Because if you're wrong, you can really set somebody free that doesn't belong to be free or you can imprison somebody that doesn't belong to be imprisoned. A couple more facts. Guns do not hold fingerprints well. I believe the gun makers do this on purpose, but nobody can prove that. Um, but casings do. So the casing outside the shell, that holds fingerprints really well because it's a nice smooth surface. So if you see casings, never handle them. Put your pen inside them, pick them up, do something so you don't actually touch the casing and get your fingerprints on it. You could ruin a police officer's case. Additionally, all bullets have unique markings on them. When a bullet goes down the barrel, it gets that rifling on it, it scratches the bullet. And every gun has its own like distinct fingerprint to it. So you never want to touch the uh, bullets when they come out of the body because they may have fingerprints on them as well. When the bullet goes into the chamber, it may be misaligned, so every single gun is different for that. All right, now remember too, there are secondary <coughs> projectiles. When a bullet hits your clothing or something that bounces off concrete, all those things can hit you as well, so you have to worry about them as well. Last thing is, don't watch a shooter's hands. Um, when they shoot a gun, they have a gunpowder residue on their hands, and if they say, I didn't shoot that person, I never shoot guns, you can actually prove it's wrong by, by taking samples off their hands. So when you do your physical exam, I want you to count all the holes. It's really important. You gotta make sure you roll them, make sure you look in all the dark, scary places. Look in their axilla, look in their groin. You can't miss any holes. It could be a matter of life and death. You wanna do a good vascular exam and a good sensory exam. 
because if bullets hit nerves or bullets hit vessels, it's going to change that exam. You want to x-ray the areas. And then we have the law of trauma or the law of bullets. That number of holes plus number of bullets has to be an even number all the time. All right? Very, very important concept. So if you look at this guy, he's got two holes on his neck, right? Remember, law of trauma says number of holes plus bullets has to be an even number. So you x-ray his neck, and all you see is one bullet. So two holes and one bullet, that's three. That's an odd number. So now you have to go hunting. When you shoot the belly film, you find the second bullet down in his belly. He probably stopped in his neck, went down to his esophagus, and he swallowed it. All right, because it crosses the diaphragm. It's not in the lungs. So you got shots. So those are two. Two like, entrance holes and two bullets. But it also minus, I got shot before, and there's one that was sitting there. So that is possible. You have to ask them the history to make sure they don't have bullets inside them already. That'll offset your count. That is definitely a true statement. The only time it doesn't obey the rule when it's a graze. All right, this guy got very lucky. The bullet grazed him, so one hole and no bullets inside. It's just a graze. It's an odd number. But you can tell usually a graze because they're oblong and they don't enter the tissue. But you can't always tell. You have to do the film. <coughs> you have to check. So management of bullet wounds. These are your basic ABCs, every part of the circulation. You want to control the bleeding and resuscitate them. So direct pressure on the hole usually fixes the problem. Usually, but not always. Um, and then you want to resuscitate them. The flu you use resuscitate, that's sort of up in the air. And how much fluid you give, also up in the air. All right? Some people say give normal saline. The trauma surgeons like, like LR. And the new trend is really not to give them anything as long as their blood pressure is not in the tank. So you just want to let them live hypotensive. So we had a good case actually this weekend where a person actually had a, um, an esophagectomy for cancer and got radiated. And the, the uh, carotid artery eroded through the skin. So they dropped all their blood onto the floor. Their blood pressure went really low, and they stopped bleeding. They came in, and we tanked them up. We gave them four units of blood right away and some NS. We took them to x-ray, or to get a CAT scan, a CT angio, and they coughed and blew out a hole because the pressure behind the clot was now strong again, and they started to gush out again. And then they just went directly to the OR. But if you leave them hypotensive, you can get to the OR without losing more blood. When you lose blood, you lose products, you lose platelets, you lose cells, you lose everything. You have to remember you're going to give them all that back. You should definitely give them antibiotics. People say the bullet is hot enough so it sterilizes it. That may or not be true, but it doesn't matter. You're hitting somebody in the shirt, it's dragging all their shirt covered in bacteria deep inside their body. That's all filled with bacteria. So you definitely want to give them antibiotics. Usually something like a first-generation cephalosporin, something that's going to cover good gram positives. All right? You need your angiograms to see what vessels are messed up. And then we should be using more TXA. It's a relatively cheap drug, and it's been proven in the CRASH-2 trial that it stops bleeding internally. It's also the current like thing. If you guys are keeping up with the list serve, it's the current thing that the list serve is yeah, going insane that, yeah. about this week. So they should, asking if they should be like, everyone in should the be field and everything. And all the good, all the smart people are responding yeah. right now on that list. Everybody really should be giving TXA for gunshot wounds, definitely without a doubt. <coughs> and then finally, you can apply a tourniquet above the wound if you can't control the bleeding. But you really should be not using that many tourniquets unless you really, really need it. It's more for EMS outside. But if it's bleeding in your bed and it's bleeding a lot, you should apply a tourniquet. So let's review. The cartridge is equal to the case plus the primer plus the powder plus the bullet. A bullet is only the top part. Remember your correct uh, terminology. Kinetic energy equals mv squared over 2. And the amount of energy a bullet can deliver to your body is dependent on its velocity and its mass. Rifles have much higher speeds than handguns, but they still make a big hole. Kinetic energy is converted into damage as long as the bullet stays inside you. All that energy is converted into damage. Remember your primary cavity and your secondary cavity. And then stretchy tissues are less likely to get damaged than non-stretchy tissues. So lung and muscle will deform and come back, while brain and bone will just be deformed and be destroyed. Do your ABCs, control your bleeding, and then get them definitive care after resuscitation. Thank you, guys. Do you have any questions? <laughs> it took me a long time to do that. I had to cut, you did that? I had to cut and paste all of them. Of course.